We don't talk a lot in football about mental training. And I think like football is also brains because you have to make decisions all the time. So why is we, well, I think like a football training, a physical training and technical training, you also have to train the brain. I think mental training should be always be part of your football program. Yeah, the first time I really thought, okay, this could get something. When I played in the Netherlands, uh, football, of course, when I started, it was not allowed. But at the age of 12, 13, the, the Dutch FA started a selection group from under 14, and I got selected for that. And that was so cool. Like, it was just a regional thing, but I thought, oh, this is what I want. This is really cool. Yeah, you, you were not allowed to play football as a girl. And I wanted to play football. So I thought, when I cut my hair, I looked like a boy and I could play. And my parents thought it was really nice. My twin brother was going to play. I think he came with me at that time to play football. And I, yeah, and my parents never made a problem. We just, you just do what you like. And that's what I did. Yeah, I think if you want to grow, if you want to develop, you need to be critical. And you also always have to look at the things or review the things that are going really well. And the things that go really well, you want to make even better because th those are your strengths. And it's really nice to know your strengths. But also the things that are not going very well, you want to improve. And if no one tells you and you're not aware of that, how are you going to grow? So you have to, yeah, someone has to tell you if you don't, um, if, you, if you're not aware of it yourself. And of course, in the beginning, when you don't have that much confidence and you're still finding your way when someone's critical, it's really hard to take. But the, the more experience you get, the, the better you become, the more confidence you get, you think, okay, I'm already good, but if I can do that better, that makes me even a better player or a better coach. Yeah, I had, when I played, uh, when I played, we didn't do video analysis. So I never watched myself back. And I think this, that now is really good because you just it's, you see the facts and you still can discuss about decision-making because football is a game where the ball is always open. So you can make different decisions, but you want to make the best decision in possession, out of possession. It's very technical. But, um, <laughs> but um, uh, like I had a coach um, when I was with the national team. He's actually now the coach of the Dutch national team. He coached me too. And he just, at that time, I was uh, coming from midfield to, to uh, as a deep, uh, in, in defense. And he just told me a couple of things like passing, the moment of passing. And, and that helped me a lot. Um, so, yeah, that, and, and like, I, uh, we had the discussion. I thought, well, that pass is way too far and I can't get it. And so, yeah, you can get it. So it's a little bit uh, giving feedback, but also giving me the trust that I could do it. So that really helped me at that point. Yeah, I, I just really, I want to develop myself all the time too. And this is something part of me. When I was in elementary school, I already knew I, was, I wanted to be a PE teacher. I wanted to work with people and I wanted to be in sports. And when I was seven, eight years old, there was no women coaches. There were no female footballers or professional footballers. So what we always say, what you see you can be. I could not be a coach, so I wanted to be a PE teacher. So that has always been part of me, and I, I was always looking and, and searching for improvement and growth. And that's, yeah, that gives me energy. I want to really want to win. I really want to win. <laughs> but it brings back to um, what do you have to do to win? And if I can have a little contribution to people, like even with staff members, also with players, with developing in their game or as, as a person, that really gives me energy. Talk and listen. First listen, but the, when you want people to talk, you have to ask a question. <laughs> Otherwise, people won't talk. I think that's a big learning lesson. Like every, every human being is unique. And how people learn things, is different. they learn in different ways too. So what you're trying to do, if you want, like in my environment, you want to talk to players and first connect. 
Um, because I truly believe when you connect with people, you understand better and then you can support them better too. You can help them better in their development. That's, you have to share stories with each other and you have to talk to each other and, and listen to each other. And then when you connect, you, you, when you do that and you get to know each other better, then you understand each other better too. And when you do that and you know what your purpose is, then you can give constructive feedback too, because we all know where we want to go to, and then they will accept it, I think. That's what I believe in. They, they tell me I'm really direct, and right. it seems to be Dutch. <laughs> now, look, when, when I came in in September 21, um, we, we, I met the team. Of course, I knew the team because I'd followed them, and we played them several times. And we met at Monday, and we had our first game on Friday. So I first needed to give some clarity what the week would look like. So I came in and I said, well, this is, the, this is my philosophy of coaching. This is who I am. I showed a picture of my family too. So I, I shared some private things. And I, said, and I said, well, this is the structure of the week. So we have meetings there, and, and I tried to keep it really simple, but I, I, it had to be very clear what the week looked like, what my philosophy was like we're not really going into detail because that came all over across the week but that had to be clear because we had to play on friday and then over that first week we had individual conversations with players arjen and i did that my my um, assistant coach who, who came with me he's also from the netherlands and we then we started to ask the questions um you know well we first started to ask questions for what made this team so good and what do we need to do to make this team even better and get to the next stage? And then we saw as well, you know, more personal questions which they wanted to share or not. That's up to them. Um, I found it important to tell them uh, what my values were. Uh, my values are respect. I always try to treat everyone with respect, uh, growth, development, and clarity. <laughs> so I gave clarity straight away. <laughs> This is how we're going to do. And I didn't say, this is how we're going to play and things. We tried to figure out how they had, and of course I'd seen that too. So the, the, like the fundament of this team was there already. If you make the semi-final three times in a row, then they have done a really good job. So when we came in, um, I just thought, okay, what's going really well? And what can we add to make the next step? Because there was already a big fundament. Talking about Jill, so coming back on that, it's a nice story. So what we did to try to connect, like Jill was probably, like I, the Linus is there incredible and they all are unique and different personalities and I really, I'm really, i so proud of them, what they do on the pitch, but also how they change the, the society in a positive way. But Jill is just the most special person I've ever met. Like, it's just incredible how she does everything now too. She's all over the place, all over the world yeah. and she's <laughs> always smiling. And, and talking to them, but so a couple of camps, then we wanted to connect. So what we did, we paired, we paired players and staff and we gave them a task to talk, to talk about themselves and get connected. And I, um, I mixed up with Jill. So we went out for a walk at St. George's Park and she said that, that she felt a little uncomfortable. I thought, Jill, uncomfortable. I've never ever seen her uncomfortable. <laughs> And then we said, then it fell apart, and we really had very nice conversations and got really connected and talked all about personal stuff. When, when we came in, so the, then I noticed that some players in training things went well, but then we played the game, and I thought they don't take action. They they, they just pass the ball to knowledge. So you make that decision. I thought this is we're so much better than this. So I just encouraged them to take action and. When you take action, you can do something extraordinary and you can make a mistake. But you, at least you can learn from those things um, and, and you show who you are too. So you, you have to take action. And if you make the same mistake five times in a row, then we have a problem and the player has a problem too. So you do have to learn from your mistakes. Yeah, what we did, um, I, that was right before the Euros 2017. And um, we, we, we were doing okay, but you could feel that we weren't, um, as a team, we weren't telling each other, we weren't honest enough. When a mistake was made, you, would, you saw body language, but it didn't say anything to each other. And I thought, if that's going to happen in an opening game against Norway, under the highest pressure, then you see the real behaviors, because then it comes out. 
So what you want to do is have those moments before you are under the highest pressure. Um, and, and so I thought we have to do something to get people annoyed so things happen. So what we saw when someone got um, made mistakes and then got annoyed and started doing other things, so not doing her task anymore. But when you have 11 players on the pitch and one player stops doing her task, I just said a couple of times, then the team doesn't can count on her anymore. And that's not what you want, because then as a team, you, you don't play good enough. Or, or that depends on how good the opponent is, of course. So we tried to, yeah, we tried to organize that. We were ref we always horrible referees when we referee ourselves. But now we even, on purpose, were even worse than horrible. So they got really annoyed. And what we saw in the training session, we filmed all the training session, that they started doing totally different things. Like the center defender was just going into attack and trying to do it all on her, on her own. And I thought, okay, that's good. But they got so pissed off <laughs> that they started, of course, uh, blaming me being a bad referee. And I got really pissed off too. So it actually had influenced mine too. <laughs> so I thought, well, this is not what I meant. They should, and sh I should stay calm and they should really get annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> so then after that training camp, everyone went, went home and I thought, okay, leave them. And I had some time also to relax. And um, so then in the weekend, I called uh, a couple of players and said, okay, this is what happened. This is what you should do. You, we can make a huge step with the team now. Do you want to contribute to that? And of course, they want to contribute to that. So they thought about it. Other players jumped in. So the opening meeting for the next uh, moment we came together, they took the floor and said, okay. And I, we, showed, we showed the clip that not doing the task anymore, not being accountable and what we had to do to make this or to prevent this or to do behave better as a team and as a team player. And that was really, really helpful. Yeah, I think, you know, as you can read from the book, so I, I try to prepare as good as possible and, we, and together with the staff. So whenever we go into camp or whenever, that's for training sessions, but it's also for games. And I think I should relate this to games. Um, so you, you, you have your style of play, you have analyzed your opponent, you make your game plan um, related to the opponent you play against. And then you, you try to, to turn every stone so you're prepared as good as possible. And when you do that, then at, when the moment comes and you, you play the game, you just have to observe really well. And then it comes to your intuition because you have prepared everything. And then what you see, um, so that's why you all, I think you should stay calm because the calmer you are, the better you can observe, the better decisions you can make. And then it's, it's, it's feeling what you have to do. Um, so for example, when we played, we played playoffs with the Netherlands, so we were, became European champions. Then we lost one game against Norway and we had to play playoffs to qualify for the World Cup. And we, um, we played Switzerland. And we won the first game 3 0. And everyone thought, oh, we're there. And then I thought, okay. Then I start thinking, okay, we, we, there was a big difference. What can happen? What, what, what would prevent us from making the World Cup? What, what things could happen? The only, pro, tro, the only situation that could trouble us is getting an early red card. And what would I, what would I do then? So you're trying to think in scenarios all the time. So, um, um, in the seventh minute, one of the players got a red card. <laughs> so, but I had to prepare, I thought about that, we discussed it, so it was like, okay, this, this, this needs to be done, we need to take her out, and then you really have to step up, and uh, you know, you don't have five minutes to arrange it, because then you can have, you can see the goal. So that went really quick, and then it's done, and th those are the moments then you, you'd have your intuition, but when you have thought about things, it comes quicker, and you can have quicker decision making. I think when you stay in a moment, when your thought is in a moment, you're really action thinking. What do you have to do instead of result thinking? Because when you think in results, you're not thinking what you have to do, but the consequences of things going well, right or wrong. And you, you, at the end, you can only influence a result by doing the right things. So you have to do think in actions and in your task and together with the team. That's why we say stay in the moment. I think you can train it. I think um, in, in this, we don't talk a lot in football about mental training. And I think like football is also 
brains because you have to make decisions all the time. And so, and that's what, that's brain. So you have technical ability, tactical ability, and in the game you have the system. So why is we, well, I think like a football training, a physical training and technical training, you also have to train the brain. I think mental training should be always be part of your football program. And there you can train those things by staying in the moment, learning how to direct your attention and staying in that also. But it's also the fitter you are, the less you come. Like when you get fatigued, 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 then your decision making can um, drop. Yeah. Drop because you're fatigued, and then your attention goes to other things. So f of course it's the big, the whole picture. But I think mental training should absolutely be part of it. And you can train like visualization, breathing, uh, meditation. You can really learn it. I, well, I think when you when you coach a national team, um, you, you only have them like several weeks and we have the support in that. So if a player, so we say we, we um, empower them or encourage them to do it, but the player herself, she's responsible for her development. So if she doesn't want to do it, then, um, or doesn't see the value of it, then we're not going to push that. <laughs> if you don't see the value of training sessions, you have a problem, of course. <laughs> uh, but um, if someone doesn't want to do the mental training and we're going to force and push it, it's not going to work. So someone has to be ready for it. But what we do, there's, there's two things about the mental training. It's like uh, team dynamics and um, the, the yeah, where, where the sports psychology is going to have influence on too. But it's also learning skills, individual skills. I think that should be part of a program at the club because that's a daily thing. But if players want to do it and they, don't, they want support from our sports psychologists, that's absolutely uh, um, available too. Yeah, of course, um, yeah, she, she has experienced something very hard. Over the years, I didn't know that before she came in. I just knew she was. Sometimes she was selected, and sometimes she was not. But when I came in, she performed really well for the club. So we said we have to bring her in. And then um, when she, we had some training sessions, she did really well in the training sessions. So uh, and as I said, the first camp we had individual uh, chats with players. So I did that with Darren Ward, the goalkeeper coach, and myself. And we had the chat, and um, that was later on in the week. So we also decided who was going to play. Um, so we combined that that um, conversation, and she said she was really grateful that she was selected. She didn't expect it, and then um, it was a little bit emotional. And, and I said, "But we just said, well, you performed really well, so you deserve to be selected because that's what you did, and you performed so well in this camp that you're going to start tomorrow too." And that became really emotional because she didn't expect that at all. She was a little low in confidence. Um, and I, I said, well, you know, this now there was some goalkeepers, well, some of the goalkeepers weren't there and they had been there at the Olympics and before, but they were injured too. So I said, I don't know how the future goes, but right now you've performed at the, the, be at the best and we think you should play, so you can play on Friday. And from then she just did so well. So she, she talks highly about me, but basically, her performances that make, made us make the decisions to put her in, in the starting lineup. Well, that's one of the most incredible uh, sports moments of my life. So that noise, I will never forget that noise. I told you were there. <laughs> yeah. I think it was also your support because that helped a lot too. You kept us going. So one December first, you have to be there too, just so you know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so um, what Jill said. What, what I noticed when I when I came in, like I know I, when I was an international player, I, we were happy when there were five thousand people coming to watch us. And now we the, the game has changed so much. So lots of people come out there. Uh, travel, some travel the whole day to come there, and we went on the pitch and we went like this. And thought so we have to focus on the game. And I thought we should be really grateful and happy that, and we were happy. But they thought 
that I was thinking that they wouldn't weren't focus on football when they would wave to the fans. So I said, you, you better go out and wave because they took all the efforts to come and support us. And I, I, I know you're such professionals that you go out there, you wave, and then you start your warm up. And I'm not thinking you're not focused on football, but you're in this stage now, you play at the highest level, and it's an absolute privilege that you're allowed to play for 80,000 people. So we better enjoy it. Yeah, I think, you know, in life, so also in football life, things, uh, sometimes things go really well, and sometimes things don't go well, and you don't have control of a lot of things in life. My sister um, got diagnosed cancer right before the Olympics in the Netherlands, and it, yeah, it took about a little more than a year uh, before she passed away. And at, at the moment I started um, in England, she was already ill. So, and I thought when I sign a contract abroad, I hope that everyone stays healthy because otherwise it become really hard. And then she, she got that. Um, but we found a way and it was really nice. We played one game in Luxembourg so she could come and drive there. And unfortunately, she couldn't come to England at all because she just, we had bad news, but she got bad news all the time. So before the tournament, we knew she was going to pass away because she went really downhill. Um, of course, you don't really know the moment, but she went really bad. And, but we had had so many conversations. Uh, together and she was such she's one of my biggest fans uh, and my husband he's over there uh, but um, so she said you better perform there and you better go get that um, get that prize and I'll be there I'll sit on the crossbar on, or on the on the post for you and we we had some of those moments and it was so close so she she wanted me to do well and of course, I wanted the team was so supportive. The FA, the whole team was so supportive. So I could park it at that moment and perform really well. I actually really enjoyed it too. And afterwards, uh, I got hit a little bit. So she, when she got really at the end of her life, and I had to go, she told me, Serena, you have a training camp, you have to go. I found it really hard. So I said, well, can I take something from you? And, and so she gave me her bracelet. Um, so I, that just felt really nice. And I just kept it, I still have it on. And Well, at that moment that you become European champion, it's so emotional. I didn't even know I was doing that. You don't even, you're not even aware anymore that the whole world is watching. There's so many cameras around you. I was just doing it. And later on, I noticed, okay, I had done that. And everyone's seeing it now, but that's fine too. It's part of life. And I felt so connected with her. Um, that was just a really nice moment. Yeah, I think, first of all, you have to embrace it. Like, you can park things for a certain amount of time, but you can't just push it away and thinking it's not there. Because, well, part of a book about it, the, the, the body keeps score. So, so then it comes back at moments you really don't want it, or you, you get pain in your body. And so you have to find a way to also grieve and mourn. Um, and, and take that time. But you can't just say, okay, now I'm going to sit down and now I'm going to be really sad. So <laughs> that doesn't help either. But at the moment come, you have to embrace it and, and, and find those moments. And then there are some moments that you have to park it for a while and then continue. And I think I can do that pretty well. I've been working in this environment for such a long time. I've, well, this was the hardest one, but there have been moments that I had to park things too. Um, and then you, at, at another moment you have the time and it, it will hit you anyway, but then you have the time to, 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 to embrace it and really take those moments to process it. Like when it's so fresh, you think, oh, it's worth everything, but then things go on and then you get so into football again, you want to win everything, you want to do all your best and you get sucked into it again. Yeah. But what, you, what, what does uh, happen is when you, want, when you can do things now, don't wait do things now when you have the opportunity to do it, some things you really want to do. So don't wait, because you don't know what your life looks like next year. Things can happen so quickly. So that's what I really learned. And yeah, just family is the most important thing and health. Family and health is just the most important thing. It doesn't mean you, you have to make choices when you're in this environment. You can't just say, okay, now, now it's family time. I'm not coming to a training session. <laughs> that's not how it works. But, but yeah. You just have to, to work on, on everything to keep things right. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. So I, I've experienced that, um, well, I think the women in the room, I'm, I know I'm generalizing a little bit, but that's how it works for me and that's what I've heard from a lot of women. When they ask you, do you want to have this job? The first thing you think, okay, I, I can't do this and I can't do that and, can't, and I can do that. But you first think, what well, you can't do. I think with a lot of men, so you can <laughs> confirm or not, they think, Look yes, I'm going to do it. And then they start the job and they think, hmm, maybe this is not yeah. right yet. But the first My wife goes, is nodding oh, at the back of the room <laughs> right now. <laughs> so I, I think that's so... Yeah. That's why it's also important that, you know, when you have these process, you need women in the room. And women, most of the time, need a little encouragement and a little more time to overthink things and then um, take the decision. Oh, yes, you're, you're now looking very different, your face. <laughs> no, but I think, no, I think that is like, Ellen, I talked to Eleanor, the, the, um, like three women in... in um, that are in, in different uh, uh, environments also working in, in men dominate or yeah. have, uh, on, at the highest level. And we share those experiences too. They, so, uh, like, you have to encourage women a little more in general, I think, and give a little more time and not think, oh, she's insecure of that. No, we just need a little more time and need to be encouraged so you can't do it. Well, I think I'm so happy that I've been part of this whole journey and I could not imagine that we're here now where we are. Uh, so, and that's so positive and I'm really positive we have, because have, we've taken so many steps forward and I think we're going into the right direction. But I also think we still have a long way to go. So it's a little bit of both. Yeah, I think what we learn about the women's game that's develop, developing very quickly. So what we see at the World Cup, some um, unexpected scores. So talking about football development now. Um, I think lots of teams now, they are better in defending. So they're more structured. They also, the players are fitter. So especially, like the, the, I'm not talking about the top country, but the country, they're catching up with, it, with the top. So that they can defend really well and they can, can keep doing that the whole game. And they're more dangerous on the counter-attack too. But I also think we have some data on that. I also uh, think that we as England, we want to dominate the game. We want to... Um, and we have to become even better to that, being tight on the ball. But the chance of winning is, is higher then. But we also have to be prepared to take out the counter-attack. We basically saw that against Germany uh, the other day too. Um, so that's the change and that will come closer and closer. Um, and I think what, yeah, the learnings from that, what, what this team did in, in the World Cup, we had so many challenges before the tournament and during the tournament, and the team showed so much resilience and we were so adaptable to new situations, also changing the style of play, injuries, the red cards. I think they did incredible under the circumstances we were in. And, and I hope we can keep building on the resilience and becoming better, keep growing. And hopefully um, we can stay at the top level. Yeah, well, you're never sure. Uh, but I think, yes, we had two, uh, two losses in four games, in the qualification games. I think um, when you look at, at those games, um, I think the Netherlands, the first half, they were better. The second half, I thought we played, we played a good game and we just were struggling scoring goals. And we were very unlucky to get a late call against Belgium. I think it's, it's almost a miracle that they scored three goals because we had the ball for 75% and we were in their final third all the time and we could have scored lots of goals. We just we have to do a couple of things better there. So I think how we played and how we wanted you know, to show who we are, we didn't even do that bad. Just the final pass, we have to do better. And um, I think we were a little bit unlucky in that game, but un unluck is also we have to... Uh, we need to get back that final edge because I don't really believe in luck and unluck. So, um, yeah, we have to do a couple of things better. I, I always say when you go really well, when you go really well, stay neutral. And we, we have an English phrase on that. Uh, when you really well, you go on a pink cloud. Uh, it's like you become a little bit more complacent. No, always stay neutral because only when the results are going really well, you always have things that go really well, but you also have to keep developing um, to stay at that level. Now we had some disappointing uh, results. Um, and when you see the data, then actually we didn't play 
that bad. Yeah, we definitely have to do a couple of things better, but we're not all of a sudden a bad team. And so we're not, we have to stay neutral too and bring back, okay, what do we have to do? How do we stick together? What's our game plan again to, uh, on December 1st? Yeah, and we know we have to win two matches, but actually want to win every game. And it's, it's absolutely doable, I think. Um, and we're going to do everything to win those games. Um, well, the, with the development of the game, um, I um, keep keep connected with players, keep connected with staff, and trying to get better. Keep listening to the players on what what do we need to do better, but also keep the trends, and that's what we're doing. So, what, what's developing? What do we have to do then? Um, and hopefully, and that's what I really want: get feedback also from players and staff to say, okay, where can I still improve in things? I think you can always improve in things. Mm -hmm.